Excellent. Thank you. Great. So welcome everybody to this Evidence Library event. It's really great to see so many of you and I can see others joining as we start off now. Um, this event is part of our Evidence Library event series, giving you the chance to ask your own questions of leading academics and sector professionals talking about the latest research on important criminal justice topics. I'm shortly going to be handing over to John Collins, who will be running through a short presentation based on his Evidence Library review that we're here to talk about today. Then I've got a few questions that I'll be asking John, um, and then I'll hand over to you, um, to the audience, for any questions that you may have. Russell Webster's here, who has been working with Clinks in producing these evidence briefings, and he'll be leading on that Q&A session with you all in a little while. So if you do have a question for John, please do post it in the chat and Russell will be collecting them together and we'll kind of come to you to get to ask those questions when we get to the Q&A section of the event. So let me introduce John. So John Collins is the Chief Executive of Prisoners Education Trust, the UK's leading prison education charity. PET offers distance learning courses and related advice and guidance to people in prison and works to improve prison education and show policymakers and the public the impact that education in prison has. John joined PET in April 2021, having previously been the chief executive of the Magistrates Association, the membership body for magistrates in England and Wales. Prior to that, John was chief exec of Restorative Justice Council, and he's previously worked at the Police Foundation, the Criminal Justice Alliance, the Fawcett Society and NACRO. John has also been a member of the Victims Commissioners Advisory Group and a member of the Commission on Crime and Problem Gambling and a governor of a London primary school. So some fantastic experience, John, and over to you. Thanks very much, Emma, and thanks very much for inviting me along today. Um, I am, as Emma said, going to speak briefly, um, then I'm really looking forward to the questions and the discussion. Um, I've got a few slides to share, so I'm going to Try and get that to work. Um, hopefully, you'll now be able to see that. Um, so I'm just going to run briefly through a, a quick presentation, just covering some of the uh, some of the key points that I thought might be useful to sort of spark off the discussion. Um, Emma's already given a pretty comprehensive introduction to PET and what we do, but it's summarised again on the slide. Um, as Emma said, our primary work um, with prisons is provision of distance learning and related um, IAG. Um, but we also take a broader interest um, in prison education policy in England and Wales, which is why I'm here today. Um, so I've come along to talk about this review, um, which I produced uh, for Russell and Clinks as a review of the evidence on prison education. Um, I was told beforehand that I didn't need to repeat everything that was in it because everyone would have already read it, um, which seemed very confident. Um, but I will. Uh, but I'm not going to talk through all the detail of it. I'm happy to pick up any any of this in in the Q and A afterwards. Um, but essentially, what the review tries to do is both look at the current provision of prison education in England and Wales, and look at what the evidence is around what impact it has. I should say I saw someone asking this in the chat just before I uh, just before I started my slides. It looks primarily at the provision of education to adults rather than young people. Um, education for young people in YOIs um, is complex and somewhat different from the adult estate, um, and I couldn't cover it all in the word count that I was given, which I pretty much doubled anyway. Um, it is a separate and really interesting issue, um, and but some of the issues that I think I'm going to talk about today cut across both the adult and the youth estate. Um, so just to summarise what the review says um, in one short slide, uh, which takes up many more pages than the actual review, um, I think at the moment there's a there's a broad sense that nothing in the criminal justice system works, that the sort of nothing works, everything's broken, um, it's impossible to make any positive difference. But actually, when you look at the evidence around prison education, it is uniformly positive. So we know from a whole range of reviews, from big systematic reviews, mostly done in the US, to smaller pieces of work here in England and Wales, both in terms of evaluating specific initiatives or programmes, including the work that PET does, but also evaluations of the mainstream education provided in prison um, through the current uh, contracting system uh, and sponsored by the Ministry of Justice, that actually it all pretty universally says the same thing, which is that education has a positive impact. So we know from all that evidence that taking part in education while in prison reduces the likelihood of reoffending after release. We also know that participating in education improves the likelihood of getting a job post-release. So those two outcomes, which can be pretty robustly measured, 
um, with a whole range of different uh, different methodologies, all show that those two findings pretty consistently. And feeding that into a cost benefit model, you can see again pretty consistently across all the work that's done that the provision of education in prison is cost effective, with benefits far outweighing the costs. This is not unusual for any. Um, intervention that can be demonstrated to reduce reoffending because the cost of reoffending is so high. If you can reduce that by any by any margin, um, you, you get a reasonable cost benefit. But the Ministry of Justice evaluation of prison education um, under the OLAS contracts, which are the um, predecessors of the current contracts, suggests that um, there's a cost benefit of a ratio of about about five to one. So um, really quite significant uh, cost benefits. And as another example, an evaluation of our own work that was done with pro bono economics um, showed that even within a year, you get quite significant cost benefits um, just through that reduction of reoffending. So we know that prison education works. We know that it, it reduces some of these key measures that, um, that are very important to governments. We also think, I think, from our own work and from other work in this area, that it has broader benefits around well-being, mental health, um, people's sense of engagement with the prison regime. As I talk about in the review, there's maybe less, there is some evidence around that, but maybe less robust than these, these sort of easier to, to measure numerical benefits that I've highlighted here. So we know that prison education works. And we also know that, and it's worth remembering that people in prison are actual real human beings, they're not just numbers. So as well as the evidence that shows that prison education works, um, there is sort of endless qual uh, qualitative evidence, again, that, that, that shows similar things. These are just two quotes from two of our learners at Prisons Education Trust, um, feeding back onto the courses that we've had. And I think if I wanted to write a couple of quotes um, that demonstrated the impact of education in prison, and I didn't write these, um, this is pretty much what they show. Transformational change, improved relationships with families, reduced reoffending, um, And the idea of, of hope and change is really important in terms of why people engage with prison education and what they've got out of it. So like I said, numerical evidence, data-driven evidence, evidence of our own work, um, and, and endless qualitative evidence from learners of the difference it's made for them. Um, we also know that prison education is needed. Um, and I'm not going to dwell on this too much. I think it's pretty well established at this point. But we know that people coming into prison in England and Wales have much lower levels of educational attainments than the general population. So when everyone comes in, they're meant to do an English and maths assessment. Um, and you can see here the findings. So the significant majority of people um, for both maths and English are in entry level one, two or three, which, and you can't directly compare adult and uh, youth attainment, but it's broadly what, you, entry level three is broadly what you'd expect from someone leaving primary school. And I always think it's worth highlighting because that's often the level that's discussed. There is a significant people coming into prison who are at entry level one. Um, so right across there on the left of the chart, which means they've really got very low levels of literacy indeed, or struggle to read very simple, basic um, instructions and information which will make, apart from anything else, it extremely difficult for them to properly engage in prison with the regime and with the other things that are available. So we know from this that, that people need access to education. We also know that people coming into, um, into prison are more likely to have learning difficulties and disabilities than the general population, um, are more likely to have been permanently excluded from school, um, and are less likely to have any form of qualification um, than the population as a whole. So they're a, they're a population with significant um, educational needs. So we know that education works. We know that people. We know why people need access to it. Is it delivering? Um, this graph, which again um, many of you will have seen, tracks participation in education over time. So how many courses have been delivered in prison? Um, to put it simplistically, as you can see um, over the last decade or so, after a high point in about 2015, the overall number of people participating has been dropping. Um, there's obviously a sharp drop during COVID and a partial recovery since, but the overall numbers are significantly lower than they were. Um, 10 years or so ago. So fewer people are participating in education than they, than they were. Um, but numbers isn't, isn't the be all and end all. Obviously, quality is important too. But unfortunately, the picture there isn't an awful lot better. Um, so these are the outcomes of Ofsted uh, inspections uh, over the last decade or so. Um, obviously, COVID has, an impact here, has had an impact here, and we can't ignore that altogether. But looking at this table, and without wanting to unpick every number, you can see that many, many more prisons are now in the requires improvement or inadequate categories, so the worst two Ofsted ratings, and fewer are in the good category. Um, there's never been many judged outstanding, um, but you can also see that over the last few years, none are. 
So where we've got an incredibly needy population in terms of educational need, where we need the very best quality of education, based on Ofsted's judgments at least, um, the quality of what's being provided isn't nearly as high as it could be and as it used to be. Um, so uh, we know that in terms of Ofsted judgments, it's not as good as it could be. And we also know, these are a couple of quotes from, from Ofsted's annual reports from the last couple of years, um, that generally it's considered that the provision of education in prison is significantly worse than in other comparable sectors. So much worse than in schools, but also much, much worse than FE colleges and other forms of community adult education that would be more comparable um, to, to prison education. So there's not as much of it as it used to be. It's not as good as it used to be. And it's not as good as comparable uh, provision in the community. I just want to say in passing, I absolutely recognise that delivering education in prison is extremely difficult. It's a very challenging environment. I will come on to that. So, um, but we, need, we do need to recognise that the quality as well is not as good as it could be. Um, I said I would speak briefly and I already haven't. Um, so just one more slide um, to finish on. So we know it's important. We know it's not as good as it could be at the moment, but can we make it work? Um, and I'm slightly more optimistic here than, um, than, than it, it might seem from what I've said so far. I think there are a few changes um, around at the moment that do present an opportunity now to improve the delivery of prison education in England and Wales. So over the last few years, um, Ofsted in their, in their role as the inspectorate um, and the prisons inspectorate who work along Ofsted, alongside Ofsted in terms of inspecting prisons, have really focused on prison education, driven in part by the fact that Charlie Taylor, who's now Chief Inspector of Prisons, has a background in education, used to be a head teacher, um, and really understands and values the importance of education and has worked closely with, with Ofsted um, to build on and develop their work um, around improvement of prison education. Just as a simple example, Ofsted now meet regularly with prison governors to talk with them about what good quality education looks like. Um, but they're also doing more work underpinning their inspections to think through what, what a good um, prison delivery looks like. So that's driving, um, driving some momentum behind change. The current government has also um, put quite a lot of emphasis on prison education. Um, there was a commitment in the last manifesto for a new prison education service. Um, and just as we get to the end of this, this parliamentary term, some of those reforms are now starting to roll out. So some changes to prison education um, have started to be introduced. Um, for example, new heads of education, skills and work, which is a new post um, at the senior management team level in prisons. Um, new, new diversity support officers have been introduced. Um, some work with employers to uh, to bring in employment related training. So there are some changes going on. They're not as comprehensive or as radical as I might want to see, but there are things being introduced. Um, and importantly, there will be new contracts for the mainstream delivery of, of core prison education um, from April 2025. We're currently in the middle of the, uh, of the bidding process for that. Um, I don't think, again, necessarily those new contracts will be as radically different um, from what we've currently got, as some of us would have liked. But nonetheless, it's an opportunity to take stock of where we've got to and think about how we can improve um, what's delivered to most people in prison. So we are, I think, at something something of a sort of, not a turning point, but an opportunity to take stock and renew. Um, and there's also obviously the, the possibility with a general election later this year and the expectation that there may be a new government. Again, an opportunity to take stock and to think about how we can we can improve things. And I tend to think that these things go in cycles. Um, a few years ago, Michael Gove came in as Justice Secretary, Sally Coates' review was commissioned, there was quite a focus on prison education, um, that maybe didn't lead to as much change as we would have hoped, but this, now, this issue is now coming back into focus with another look at how we can make things work better than they do. And finally, um, and I think this is always really important to say, um, quite a lot of what I've said is quite, is quite gloomy and downbeat, but when I go around prisons, there is some brilliant work going on, demonstrating what can be done even within a prison environment, however difficult and how challenging, how challenging that is. That's in mainstream provision, brilliant literacy and numeracy work, but also a whole range of other things that fall alongside or outside the mainstream provision. Um, drama, design, art, music, a whole range of different things that engage people, inspire people and get them involved in education. So the challenge for me um, and I think for all of us, hopefully on this call, is think about how we can make those exceptional pieces of work, what happens routinely across the prison estate, and how we can give people in prison the opportunity to engage in the education that they want to do, that inspires them, and that helps them get to where they want to go to after they leave prison.
Um, I could talk more, but I'm going to stop there. Um, and I'm going to hand over to questions and I'm going to try and stop sharing at the same time. Thank you so much, John. Thanks for that presentation. It was a really useful summary and to think about some of the what's next key points that I'm sure we'll get into as part of the Q&A. Um, but I've got a couple of questions that I was thinking about following reading your review that I wanted to ask before I hand over to the floor. And you just shared on the on your slides the graph around participant levels, uh, participation levels decreasing. And obviously, even despite the drop in COVID, the, the um, recovery has still been an overall decline over the last 10 years. And I just wondered if you could share with us why you think that is um, and what do you think needs to happen to sort of get those levels up to what we would like to see? Yes, of course. Um, and I think as ever with prison education, there's not one simple straightforward answer. There's, there's a range of different things interacting, but I'll try and keep it relatively brief. Um, I think the, the th there are three main ones, really. Um, the first and maybe most important is funding. Um, so um, funding for prison education hasn't kept up with inflation over the last decade or so. Um, and all other things being equal, if there's less money, there'll be less education provided. Um, there have been some some attempts to uprate the prison education contracts um, in recent years, but the general view talking to the providers is there isn't enough funding available to do the work that they would like to do. Um, and linked to that and related to that, um, the way that the funding's managed, the contracts, the way they're set up and the things that people are, are required to report on don't give the flexibility that some of the providers would like to, to develop and um, amend the way they deliver things to make sure it aligns with what the prison population wants and needs. But funding and, and the contractual arrangements are, are a key um, are a key part of the issue. Um, second area I think which is really important is the state of the prison system as a whole. Um, so everyone on the call and involved in the sector will know how much the prison system is struggling at the moment um, with overcrowding, staff shortages, restricted regimes, partly as a result of, of the COVID pandemic, but I think extending well beyond that. Um, and if people are locked up in their cells or stuck on their wings and can't get down to classrooms, they won't be able to access mainstream education or training um, or training opportunities doesn't mean there aren't some things they can do in their cell, but it won't be picked up in, the, in that data that we were just looking at. Um, and just to give an example of that, um, in one one quarter last year, 42% of education classes at Pentonville were cancelled for operational reasons. So things that had nothing to do with the education department, to do with the broader prison. That's a bit of an outlier. It's generally lower than that, um, but it is having a consistent impact in terms of delivery. You can't get people into classrooms consistently. Um, they can't they can't do the, the the educational opportunities that are provided there. A link to that, not just the regime, it's also the physical state of the prison estate. Um, so lots of education departments are not in a good state. Most sort of most dramatically, I noticed the other day that um rack concrete has been found in Northumberland prison in the education block, and they've had to close it all together. Um, but there are other examples of classrooms that are in poor state of repair or can't be used. Um, so it's both both literally can't use them, but also in terms of an environment for studying in a classroom that's practically falling down, um, doesn't necessarily give the, the sense of somewhere where you want to study and, and learn um, for learners or indeed for teachers. Um, so I think the, the general state of the prison system and the prison estate are really important. Um, and thirdly, and, and sort of finally, in terms of, uh, of sort of key issues, I think, um, I think education providers are really struggling to recruit and retain prison teachers. Um, so we know that some classes don't just don't go ahead because there aren't there aren't the people available to teach them. Um, we also know that there are examples of people having to teach subjects or areas they're not experts in because there isn't the, the, the right teacher available to, to take that particular class. Um, I think that prison teachers generally do a brilliant job in often impossible situations. Um, but as a profession, I think prison teachers are struggling. Um, and we, with the Prisoner Learning Alliance, um, did a survey of prison teachers um, with UCU in 2021, um, and only three out of 10 teachers who responded to that survey said they expected to be in prison education for longer than five years, um, and that is three, three and a bit years ago. Um, and then obviously not every single one of them will leave, but I think if you have a, if you have a, a teaching population that wants to get out, um, it's also generally a, a sort of an aging uh, population with fewer people coming, fewer young people coming in. It's going to create real problems, both in terms of experience and quality of teaching, but also in terms of actually just filling the classrooms and having the teachers available. I do want to say again, there are some brilliant prison teachers out there, many of whom um, contribute, have contributed to our work and the PLA's work over the years. 
um, and some of whom are probably on this call, so I'll be very clear, I'm not being rude about you. Um, so in terms of increasing those levels again, I mean, yes, more funding for prison education, better support, CPD training and pay for prison teachers. But then I think you also do need to look at the fixing the broader problems of the prison system, which is obviously not easy, but I think it's really difficult to look at prison education entirely in isolation without looking at the broader, um, you know, sort of broader state of the prison estate. We may come on to talk about this a bit later, but the two are closely interlinked and you can't expect to run top quality prison in a prison estate that's literally and metaphorically falling to pieces. Yeah, thank you, John. That's a really useful reflections. And as you say, it can't be done in silo. There needs to be a collective approach to it, sort of tackle the current situation in prisons in order to have the knock on effect of all services alongside uh, prison education. I think that it, it leads me on quite nicely to the other question I wanted to ask, which is hopefully a bit more of a positive, um, <laughs> positive outcome thinking about it, because I think that as you highlight in the review, there is limited research into what um, makes the effective prison education program. What does that look like? Um, but you have shared some really useful insights into the, what would be considered to be sort of key enablers to good quality delivery. Um, so what do you think for those that are like really striving and in many cases succeeding in delivering high quality education within prisons? What do you think that the priority considerations need to be considering the sort of challenging environment of the, what you just highlighted there? Yeah, I mean, I think it is interesting that there is less less evidence around what makes a good prison education program. It's easier to measure the, the outputs and the outcomes than what drives quality. But Ofsted and others have looked at this and there is some some evidence, including, I think, really importantly, um, some conversations with learners about what their experience has been and, and what made good prison education for them. Um, and again, I think there's there's a whole range of different things. And, and you can see that um, in in the sort of Ofsted measures and the other data that's been done. Um, but to pick out a few key ones, I think. Um, I think, first of all, and some of this, particularly for those of you who are education providers, will be um, very obvious, I think. But first of all, I think you need to have a really good understanding of the cohort of people that you're working with. Um, you know, we know, and I talked about it briefly in my presentation, that while there's a huge spread of ability in terms of people coming into prison and prior educational attainment, overall and on average, you're dealing with a group with low levels of literacy and numeracy, negative prior experiences of education, higher than average levels of learning difficulties and disabilities. So it is a, a challenging and different population to work with. So I think having a really in-depth understanding of the people that you're working with, and then using that to inform how your provision is designed and the curriculum that you develop um, is, is a re is really important part of making sure that you meet the needs of the population that you're working with. Um, and I, I do think, as a really key part of that. Um, I think pretty much everyone's focused on, recognised there does need to be a focus on literacy for those people with the lowest levels of literacy and numeracy to a degree, but I think, so I think while you do need to look at the all round um, educational needs and interests of your population, all prisons should be focusing on improving the literacy skills of the people who, who are in prison. Um, and Ofsted, the inspectorate and government have all recognised that and prisons have been expected to develop a reading strategy because it's such a fundamental building block of all taking part in almost anything else. It doesn't necessarily mean you get every prisoner and stick them into a classroom and teach them how to read. There are different ways of both engaging with them um, and delivering that, uh, which, are, which you do need to be tailored to the individual needs of the, of the individual learners. Um, so getting the curriculum right based on the needs of your, of your particular prisoners is really important. Um, secondly, good quality teachers. Um, I've talked about teachers once or twice already, um, but when you when you read the the work that's been done with learners, and when you look at evidence more broadly about education in other settings, and when you look at the Ofsted requirements for prisons, good quality teaching and teachers is absolutely core to that. Um, part of that is about the support they need. Um, it's also about the training they get, the ongoing continuing professional professional development. And it's also about um, giving them the time to do their job properly. Um, and I'm sure that if you speak to prison teachers, a lot of them will tell you, sure, I know what I should be doing, but I've got 30 people with differing levels of needs and interests and prior attainment. I can't be a good teacher in that scenario. So it's partly about giving them the support that they need um, and the right resources to work with. I've already talked about the sort of physical environment as well. Um, and I would just like, I think it's important to note that I'm using teachers in the broadest sense there. So yes, paid professional teachers, but also peer mentors, peer teachers. Um, there's lots of really excellent peer work going on in prisons, both using 
um, peer teachers within classrooms to help deal with that diversity of, of prior attainment, but also out on wings um, doing one-on-one -on -one, one work. The, the moment paid professional teachers can't help to can't hope to do um, uh, those those sort of peer roles are really important. Um, and thirdly, in terms of good quality provision, um, and this comes up in quite a bit of the literature, is about having a good partnership between the prison, the education provider, and other people providing training in, in the prison. Good quality education won't be achievable if you're only thinking about what happens in a classroom for a few hours per week, for a few months for most learners. Um, so there needs to be links between classroom-based activities, other forms of training, um, and other activities that are going on um, in prisons. So you need that sort of whole prison approach. And that's why I'm I'm hopeful about the introduction of the new heads of education skills and work roles that I mentioned earlier. And um, they do have the opportunity to bind all of this together um, and making sure, making sure that we get the most out of the available resources, recognizing that it's a big job and the support they get from the governors and elsewhere in the prison will be absolutely essential to making that work. Um, and I think as part of that partnership between prison and provider, um, the role of the governor is really important. Um, if you, you, know, you need a governor who is committed to this and who drives it forward. They might not have to do much of the work, but the signaling they send around the importance of education provision in their prison is really important. And nine times out of 10, where there's a prison which we work with or we go to or we hear about doing really good stuff on education, it's because there's a governor who's willing to say, this really matters and I want it to happen. And we all know prisons are pretty command and controly. If governors really want to make things happen, they will. Thank you, John. Completely agree. Having the, gov the governor's backing is, is fundamental to that. And thank you for that really useful um, insight. I'm going to hand over to Russell now for the Q&A section, as I can see some lots of activity going on in the chat. Thank you. Thanks, Emma. Yes, do please put your questions in the chat, everyone. Uh, <clears throat> I should say at the start, I think John has laid out very clearly what we know about things not working in prison education at the moment. So I'm really I'm going to focus questions on things that might make an improvement rather than why is it going badly. I think we we could kind of spend a, a week on the former. It wouldn't possibly get us to, to where we want to be. Anyway, um, with that said, can I ask Jonathan Howard? Jonathan, you had a question in terms of how the, the broader criminal justice sector could get together to try and um, make a difference. Would you like to ask your question, please, Jonathan? Sure, thanks, Russell. Hi, John, how are you? Good, thanks. Good, good. Um, I'm very interested to know, you mentioned that you had radical and comprehensive things that you don't think are going to happen in the PES. Go on, tell us, what are they? Um, we'd all love to know. And secondly, more sensible point really is, um, what do you think that we as a community can do to improve our advocacy with policy makers and policy influencers um, to not keep on telling them what's wrong, but actually try and come up with some solutions that they might listen to? Uh, both really difficult questions to answer. So thanks, th thanks for starting with those two. Um, I mean, I think in terms Would I of... I ever ask you anything else? <laughs> I mean, I think in, in terms of... Um, in terms of more radical change. I mean, I think what, what the new contracts will look like will largely be a new iteration of what we've got now. So contracted providers focusing on literacy, numeracy, and vocational skills. Um, the vocational skills bit is really important. I haven't talked about it that much yet, but it's, it's, it's a really important part of that education picture. Um, and primarily, though, not exclusively up to level two. Um, uh, I mean, if it was up to me, uh, you'd have a much broader and wider curriculum um, so that people could get involved in a, a much wider range of subjects at different levels that interest them. Um, I'd look much more at that what, alongside the kind of core provision and, and however that's provided, looking at how you could develop partnerships with local FE colleges to broaden what's available, look at how you can do much more in terms of basic uh, peer-led literacy and numeracy work, um, building on the work that Shannon, brilliant work Shannon Trust and others are already doing, um, but rolling that out much more extensively. Um, so there's a much broader offer, so there are more things on offer, much more support for individual learners um, from beginning to end, if you like. So taking those people who come in and who are you know, entry level one literacy, where they you know they really can't read, 
a simple sign or a medicine bottle. Um, and thinking about how you support them on a one-to-one -one basis through classrooms, because um, most of those people won't be ready for classroom-based education then if ever. So through classroom and other bits of training and thinking about how they can um, progress to higher and further level of ed education towards whatever it is that they want to do and providing those opportunities. Um, and at the moment, it's something of a patchwork. It's available in some prisons and not in others. Um, so standardizing and broadening that, as I said, bringing in um, partnerships with FE colleges, universities, there are some, some prison university partnerships already. Um, and then using release on temporary license more for educational opportunities, allowing people to get out into the community to complete qualifications or degrees. Um, and lastly, uh, for this bit of it, um, I think I'd make much, want to see them make much more use of digital technology and online learning. Um, it's moving Anyone who had a, a child or or someone who they who they knew was at school during COVID saw you know education move almost wholly online, um, a sort of mushrooming of the availability of high quality digital resources. They just haven't seen followed up in in the prison system. Um, I don't think digital is the only answer. I think you need face to face provision as well, but much greater use of digital provision, particularly for people at higher levels who want to do more, more self directed learning, is a really important part of broadening out that picture. So. More breadth, more depth, more support. It's all going to cost more money. Um, but th that's what I would do if it's up to me. Um, in terms of how we how we advocate for it for it better, um, I mean, if I if I knew the answer to that, I'd, I'd be doing it. Um, I, I do think that there's there's a there's a challenge here that um, that we I people working in this space need to try and think through, and it's that there's no point at the moment um, if we think it's likely there's going to be a new government. Um, there's a very limited chance at the moment of going in and saying we want a load more funding um, because it's very unlikely to happen in the next the next round of contracts, which will probably be sort of five years. So it's thinking about how we can make more imaginative use of the resources that we've got um, and particularly potentially leveraging in community based resources. So funding that's already available to FE colleges, um, training that employers are doing, which has been a big growth in recent years in terms of employers being willing to work in prisons with people um, to train them in terms of employing them when they come out. Been a big increase, but it's still marginal um, and small and could be expanded quite significantly. So I think if we want to make really a really strong case in the next few years, we need to find ways to argue for things that will, won't cost too much money, um, but that will deliver at least some benefits and then work towards next time the contracts are being let, three to five years from now, building a robust as case as possible for an expansion in funding at that point where there might be some more funding available if we're through another spending review period. Um, and then the last thing on this, I think, is one thing that always really strikes me since I've sort of joined the prison education world is that there's loads of good stuff going on. There's lots of really interesting and innovative projects and prisons doing brilliant stuff. But by and large, it, it doesn't spread across the prison estate. Um, it, you know, so good good things that are being done in one place suffer from a, either people don't know about them. And I was at a PLA conference a couple of years ago where two people who worked in the same prison met each other at our conference for the first time. And it was the first time they knew what the other person was doing. So there's sort of sharing knowledge, but also making sure that where there are examples of good practice, they can be picked up on and replicated elsewhere. Um, you don't you can't have the same thing in every single prison because you've got different populations and different needs but where things are working we should be trying them out in other prisons and i think that doesn't happen as much as it should do thanks very much for such a comprehensive answer john um <clears throat> i thought it's interesting that although you said resources are kind of central a lot of the things you're talking about aren't the most expensive certainly in you know improving the the range of peer support and the Shannon Trust, et cetera, uh, potentially giving a lot of um, bang per buck. Anyway, I'll shut up and move us on to Margaret. Margaret Pierce has a question. Uh, <clears throat> Hi, thanks. Uh, yes, mine is, um, what works in huge prisons? Um, I'm from Wandsworth Prison Improvement Campaign. Um, and it is a huge prison with a very transient population. It's receiving, it's sending people out, it keeps them for assessment to what level of prison they should go to. So you don't get a lot of continuity. And we've also got um, a very large uh, foreign national population uh, awaiting deportation after sentence. Um, 
And also, at the moment, because of very poor conditions, they are locked up. Andrew, can I push you on to your question? Because I think you had a really good question about, I think, education in sales when people are, are mainly kind of stuck yes. in their sales for a lot of the time. I was just about to give that sentence. What works in a cell? Because they're not getting out. Thank you, Margaret. Yeah, it's a really good question. And taking Wandsworth um, as an example, you know, it's a prison that's struggling so much at the moment. I know you had the event the other day, which really highlighted that um, and, and makes it really difficult to deliver that level of instability, transient population, people in their cells the whole time, makes it really difficult to deliver anything. Um, but I think that I think there are there are a few things here. So I'm not here to champion the work that PET does, um, but for those people who are um, at higher or further level interested in, in sort of doing distance learning and have the literacy skills in place to do that, that is something that can be done in cell. Um, there can be a challenge at somewhere like Wandsworth where people go through very, very quickly um, because they don't have time to get anything started before they're moved on. Um, there is other work that's been done in cell. I mean, I, I talked about digital stuff. Um, that again, a lot of that can be done in cell where there is that provision available. But in places like Wandsworth, again, it's really limited because of the the transient nature of the of the population. I do think that during COVID. There were some real limitations around what was provided in cell for, for people in prison. And as a result, um, the Prisoner Learning Alliance, which PET used to convene, did produce some in cell resources and some links to that, which is on its website, which is archived, which I can send you. Um, but I, I think there is I think there is a bit of a gap here and we, and we could do more on this. But I, I, one thing I do think is worth stressing is that um, a lot of people who are going into prisons like Wandsworth are then going on out into um, into the estate elsewhere, sometimes for quite, quite a long time. Um, and I think one thing that we could do is, is be much better at doing assessments and working out what people's interests are and thinking about what they might want to do and then ensuring that that information follows them around the prison estate so they don't have to keep doing it over and over again. So you, if you've got quite a short period of time in a prison, using that time to do um, to do the kind of assessment work and to think about where they want to go to next, but then not then pass them on to another prison where they then have to do it all again. Um, and one of the reasons why when you're talking about data and you have to talk about number of assessments rather than number of people is that some people are assessed multiple times as they go around the prison estate because their information can't follow them. And that just feels like the sort of basic stuff we have to get right if we're not going to waste everyone's time. And then at least we can do something, something useful while they're in a, a prison like Wandsworth for a short period of time. Thanks very much, John. I'm going to move on quickly just so that we get as many questions as possible. Uh, Ella's got Let's Ella's very said, briefly uh, say oh, that um, Wandsworth. Margaret, I'm going to going to move on so that as many people as possible get a chance to ask a question. Sorry for being so uh, brusque, but um, I'm just I'm going to say just to let people know that the um, unannounced inspection is happening at Wandsworth. So sorry, six words. I will shut up. Thank you. Well done, Margaret. You got there. Um, <clears throat> Ella Simpson, please. You, I've got a question from um, a different point of view. Yeah, so just uh, thank you for your presentation, John. I thought it was really uh, succinct and interesting. And you, you talked in there about um, Ofsted being a part of the impetus for change. But I was just wondering, so um, I was a, a, a prison education practitioner for a number of years. And often Ofsted could feel like they didn't really understand the specific context um, of prison education and perhaps trying to compare it to community adult education doesn't really offer um, a sort of parallel measure. So I was wondering really, um, are there ways that Ofsted may be able to work that, that can offer a better understanding of how to use inspection um, in a more constructive and supportive way for the uh, for the ind individual establishments. Yeah, it's a really interesting question. And obviously, Ofsted has its its critics um, in the community and, and in prisons. Um, and having been a school governor in the past, I can certainly understand what some of those criticisms are. But I think from from my point of view, there's a couple of things to say. First of all, one is that it's the only independent measure we have of education quality. So while I don't think it's perfect, I think it's better than, than having nothing at all um, in terms of the quality of what's provided. Um, and secondly, I, I do think it's, it's helping to drive government to do stuff to, to make improvements. Um, while 
poor Ofsted results in prisons aren't as damaging as they are in schools or other environments. You know, talking to senior civil servants on this, they are very aware of how few good outcomes they get and whether they could do more to try and increase that. So I think it is it is driving change at that level. But I absolutely understand that the flip side of that is that um, constantly being told you're useless um, by Ofsted is pretty demoralising for prison education staff when they're doing their best in a, in a really challenging environment. Um, and I'm kind of probably guilty of that as well in terms of using that data um, and talking about it. So I think So I think a couple of things. One is... I think I mentioned that uh, Ofsted are doing work with prison governors to explain what Ofsted do and how it works. That's intended to be a, a, a two-way conversation. So it should also help Ofsted staff to better understand where, where prison governors are coming from and what their experiences are and, um, and the challenges that they're facing. Um, and I think similarly, the heads of education, skills and work are coming in, who are almost all coming in from outside the prison um, world. And while that has challenges um, in terms of what they can do. It also means they've, they've been able to present a slightly different perspective to Ofsted about what they found and, and what that experience has been. Um, but I do think, finally, um, there is there is some work going on in Ofsted at the moment um, based on you know tragic incident outside of the prison world to think about how they can be more constructive and positive in their engagement with providers. Um, and my understanding is that while that work is primarily focused on schools, it's also um, going through into their work in other sectors, including prisons. So thinking more about the way they go about their inspections, the conversations they have, um, and the uh, and the way they report findings both to the prison and, and in reports. So I think that's a really positive thing. I wouldn't want them to dilute a commitment to prison education should be good, but I do think they need to recognise the environment they're working in and recognise particularly that everyone involved can be doing a good job but because of the prison circumstances, you're still getting poor outcomes. Thank you. Thanks very, thanks very much, John. I think uh, that's clearly an area that's going to develop um, quite quickly, hopefully. I'm going to move straight on. Simon Newbury has got another a question on another topic. Simon, over to you. Thanks, Russell. And uh, hi, John, and hi, everyone else. Um, I'm going to tread very, very carefully and diplomatically as possible uh, with my question. But those who know me, uh, I, I can be a little bit blunt. R cutting to the, the question, I I wonder whether it is time to open up prison education uh, rather than viewing prison education with a capital E, a smaller E, and allow much more organisations into that marketplace who are used to delivering basic skills and employment focused courses. Those of you who've been in prison education all the way back to OLAS 1 or indeed the pilots, as I have recognised that it's been uh, completely dominated by the FE sector. And that, that absolutely is not intended to be a criticism of anyone who works in the FE sector. I know how hard prison education is. It's a genuine question. Can we, should we open up that market to other types of organisations? A lot of the really quality, good stuff, which gets uh, often spoken about, Shannon Trusby's mentioned on this Call. Cool. There's been a number of other organisations who do fantastic work, St. Giles Trust, peer mentoring, etc. They always seem to be very, very small bolt around contracts as opposed to the main meaty and let's be honest, much larger commercially uh, contracts. I just wonder whether it's time to, to shake things up a bit. It's another excellent question um, that doesn't have a, a straightforward answer, but I can see the pain on Russell's face, so I'll try and keep it brief. Um, so. I mean, yes is the short answer to your question. I think that um, it's something that the Ministry of Justice and HMPPS have been consistently keen to do, which is to open up the market to a broader range of providers. Um, that's not, not a criticism, certainly from me, of the providers who are currently there. I think they're doing the best they can in some very difficult circumstances. And it should be noted that, you know, you take Western, for example, you know, they're an outstanding provider in the community. They know how to deliver good quality education. It, but it's very difficult to do it in a prison environment. But I do think you need, and I talked a bit about this in my answer to Jonathan, you do need a broader range of provision and providers to do that. You need more of a sort of coalition of different people with different interests. And I think an experience, I think the question is how you do that. And um, we've been disappointed that um, the dynamic purchasing system, um, which is the way that governors can use small bits of money uh, to bring in additional providers around uh, around the edge of the main contracts has has worked or or not worked arguably in terms of being able to give some stability and proper funding to some really some of the really interesting bits of work that you've talked about 
Um, I think they're still looking at the DPS in terms of how you can make it work better. Um, and I think that that is valuable in terms of allowing governors to bring in complementary provision um, that, uh, that works alongside the kind of core education provision and brings in people with, with experience of, of boot camps and, and work with, with adults in the, with uh, low, levels, low levels of skills in the community and all that sort of thing. And there are some, as I talked about, some kind of interesting examples of that being done. Um, both within prison and um, on Rottle, so people coming out of prison and accessing um, community specialist provision. Um, but it's a bit slow, it's a bit piecemeal, um, and a lot of the providers find that the DPS is, I think, are, I mean, people on the call will know better than me, quite a cumbersome way of doing this. So I think finding ways to enable prisons to complement the kind of core provision with other things in a more efficient and stable way than DPS currently works would be a really good thing. Um, I think there's a much bigger conversation about um, whether or not the kind of prime provider contract model is the best way to deliver prison education. Um, I think that's something that certainly at PT we'd like to think about before it comes round again. Um, but I'm afraid I don't have an answer to that at this point. Thanks. Thanks, John. There's still time for people to get a, a last question in, but just to say, can I ask you, there's this, something you said there, which I think is a theme across many parts of um, prison provision, which is on the one hand, we often say, well, it should be the same high quality, same range of services in, in every prison. And on the other hand, we also say, well, there needs to be room to engage local um providers you know the prisons are very different you know as margaret said you know wandsworth is very different from a resettlement prison uh women's from young offenders etc so just kind of is governor autonomy the way to go or does that just lead us really back exactly where we are now with a very varying range of provision i mean i, I think if you, if you had a governor here they'd tell you their autonomy over education at the moment is is pretty limited and restrictive though they do have choices to make and and some funding that goes behind that around the curriculum um but it's pretty limited i mean i think this is this is a a really difficult question that i don't have a, 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 a sort of neat and tidy answer to um when you speak to people who've been in prison one of the things that really frustrates them is if they start a course in one prison um, and then they move and then they can't complete it so they've got half a qualification um, which is completely useless, which always makes me think, well, we should just have the same thing in every prison and then people can go from one place to the next and, and continue with the courses. And I think there is some provision for which that, that makes sense. Um, and I think one of the real challenges is less that the provision isn't consistent across the prison estate and more the information about what people have done and are doing, it doesn't follow them as they move around. And that's an endless frustration for everyone involved. Um, but I do think there needs to be consistent, some consistency of provision of some stuff so people can move from one prison to another and complete the work that they're doing. Um, I think there also needs to be some flexibility, really difficult to do with the system where it is now, for people to stay in prison as longer to complete particular courses or qualifications. You can put a hold on prisoners to complete education um, or complete courses, and it does happen. I was speaking to someone in Pentonville the other day who had stayed on for an extra sort of six weeks to finish off something he was doing. Um, but there's so much pressure on the system at the moment um, that that population needs can can you know be seen as more important than than completing courses. So there's that, but I do think you you do need some flexibility from from governors and from um, from heads of education, skills and work to bring in the things they need. They think they need to work with the population that they have. Um, and that's particularly important, maybe in you know in in the women's estate or in, or in sort of specialist prisons that work with particular populations. Um, so if you've got a lot of very long-term prisoners, for example, you're probably gonna have different needs from if you're one's worth. So you, you, I think you need that, that mixture of a core consistent layer of what's available, that's available across all the prisons, and then some flexibility around that. Um, that's what the Ministry of Justice would say they're trying to deliver now, but I just don't, just don't think it works as well as it could do. And I think part of that challenge is around the level of funding, which I know is something I said we shouldn't be talking about, but I think it's the reality. If there's not enough money to go around, governors have to make difficult choices about what they prioritise. Thank you, John. And one last question where really I'm going to summarise a lot of comments in the chat, which is this kind of overlap between the government's focus on employment and employment advisory boards, etc., 
and functional skills um, as opposed to straightforward educational variations of literacy and numeracy and just your feeling of how that whole system should tie up together um, if possible. Yeah, I mean, I think uh, one of the questions is about kind of employment advisory boards, which is one of the government's initiatives to engage employers better in into the prison system, um, which I think are, are broadly speaking a, a positive uh, initiative um, as far as they go. Um, and I think some of, some of the better operating ones have worked really well. But our experience has been at the moment, there is quite a lot of silos between different areas of work. So employment advisory boards, um, employer-led training in prisons, um, the mainstream education provision, including functional skills, but also vocational training, um, and then particular projects that are funded locally by DPS or elsewhere. Um, and then on top of that, you've got government, the government piloting a range of things um, in prisons that don't necessarily want those particular pilots and don't necessarily see how it fits in with um, with other things that they're doing. So that, I'm not sure we're getting the most out of all different opportunities that we have, and they don't necessarily um, fit together as well as they could do. So I think there is a really important bit of work to do at a prison level to think about how all the different elements of education and training fit together. Um, some of the very best literacy and numeracy work I've seen in prisons wasn't happening in a classroom at all. It was happening in bricklaying workshops or other bits of vocational training where you could blend the basic skills that people have with real real life, I, I could, how, how it can be applied in real life. Um, and then people see the value of it more, but also they get to use those skills rather than learning about them and then never using them again until they're released. Um, so I think there's something of that sort of whole prison approach. I think we need to be realistic. Um, there's always a sort of prisons should be more like schools, governors should be prioritizing education, first of all. I think we need to be realistic about the extent of which it's going to happen, given the pressures that are currently on the prison estate. But I do also think that prisons need to better align their education, their training, their employment and their resettlement work to make sure that it all fits together to make something like a coherent journey through the system um, for people who are in prison. Um, so that when they leave, they're best place to get a job to move on to do whatever they want to do next. Um, and lastly, I think that's there's a particular challenge here um, uh, around people who are on very long sentences, who, as you know, are an increasingly large proportion of the prison population. Um, so some, more and more people are spending a really long time in prison. And there's work from Prison Reform Trust and others um, that talks about those sort of wasted middle years when you're in prison, you've done all the stuff that's available, resettlement's a really long way away, and what you do in the middle. And I think how we engage those people in, in education, in training, in, in developing their, their themselves in terms of their opportunities for release is a really important other bit of the picture, um, which I don't think gets as much as much focus as it could do when there's a lot of attention to employment and sort of pre-release training. Thank you, John. And thanks everyone for such a wide range of questions and for such a lively kind of chat on, on this event. One of the features of the uh, evidence library is that we get uh, real acknowledged experts to write the reviews and I'm sure people feel the same as me that we've asked John questions about every aspect of prison education and we haven't stumped him once so thanks very much John and I'm handing back over to Emma. Brilliant thanks Russell and yeah just to echo Russell's comments there thank you John thank you for taking the time to write the review thank you for taking the time today and um, not being phased by any of the really tricky questions that came at you during the Q&A it was much appreciated and I'm sure given lots of food for thought for people to go away and be thinking about um, how that can link in with their roles moving forward. And a massive thank you to everybody for joining us today. The hour has flown by. We've reached the end of the event. So please, before you jump off, do take a couple of minutes to give us a bit of feedback on how you found the event. There'll be a question going, a uh, Microsoft form going in the chat that Paul's sharing. Um, and we're always looking for ways to improve and think about different ways of running these events. So please do take a couple of minutes to fill that out. Um, we, as we, as I said, the video will be recorded, so we will get it un, um, edited and ready to share online soon. So if there's any colleagues that you know that you think would be ben, would uh, benefit from listening to this event, you'll be able to share that with them alongside the review itself. Um, and a bit of a watch this space for Clinks and the upcoming Evidence Library events. We're meeting with Russell next week to sort of pan out what events we'll be running over the next year at Clinks, thinking about other um, experts, as Russell just commented on, to approach and make sure that we're focusing in on the right topics for the next year. 
But otherwise, um, thank you for taking the time to join us this afternoon and enjoy the rest of your day.